Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening on podcast, please make sure to leave a review. This allows my content to get in front of more people. My name is Judy Cho and I am board certified in holistic nutrition. I focus on root cause healing and oftentimes that starts with the carnivore cures meat only elimination diet. Today I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Sean O'Mara. We had a little bit of technical difficulty, so in about nine minutes in you'll kind of catch that. But otherwise, it was such an amazing interview. Dr. Sean O'Mara is a performance and longevity doctor. He is a researcher, speaker. He is a 2016 NSF grant recipient, and he is part of the nonprofit MedCon Wellness, which is a unique executive and professional athlete practice. And he is part of the MedCon Wellness where they use a lot of science and nature and technology to get the best in class results to reverse chronic disease, as well as human performance optimization. In the interview, you'll hear that Dr. Sean O'Mara was a lawyer, as well as now he is a researcher and a medical doctor. I love that he shared that a lot of his work is really about improving people's wellness and not just about making money and things like that. I love that Dr. O'Mara is really here to share wellness because he really wants people to get better. And you'll hear that in his story about why he even started everything that he's doing today. We talk a lot about the differences of subcutaneous fat versus visceral fat and why it's actually really important to keep tabs on this. You know, we talk a lot about how a lot of people will look outwardly thin, but maybe internally they are starting to show disease. And Dr. America talks about how one way is to just check your visceral fat levels. And we talk about how you can check your visceral fat. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Dr. O'Mara. I'm so excited to have you on. I had several requests of um, people in the community that really wanted me to speak with you. So I'm so excited. I love all the information you share on Instagram and just your messaging about how important it is to check certain things that we are not necessarily looking at. So for some of the people that may not know you, if you can just introduce yourself. Sure. So uh, I am a physician formally trained in emergency medicine. So I Temple University School of Medicine in Philadelphia, and uh, I had previously worked in law enforcement, was a criminal prosecutor, and so because of my background, uh, I uh, elected to apply for a scholarship through the Army to get my medical training because I, I had so many school loans out uh, by, that, by that point that I decided that uh, you know, a army scholarship would be something that I could do uh, with my law enforcement background. So I entered uh, the army and trained in emergency medicine. And in fact, uh, uh, I'm still in the army. I took a, had a little break in service for about 10 years, but I'm currently active duty with the Minnesota Army National Guard. And uh, so I, uh, about 10 years ago, was a pretty unhealthy, middle-aged, 48-year-old uh, physician you know, I would say mildly obese, pre-diabetic, clogged arteries, restless leg syndrome, and large prostate, waking up four to five times a night to to pee. I had obstructive sleep apnea, eczema, and Barrett's esophagus, which is, for those who aren't familiar, it's a very severe form of gastroesophageal reflux disease. So I having to be scoped every three months to follow my precancerous lesions that were lining my, my stomach and my esophagus at that point. So lots of, you know, significant and severe medical conditions. And then I encountered a patient that uh, was really healthy. And he told me, you know, that I should cut out carbs and, and uh, eliminate processed foods. And I didn't know anything about it. I just started doing that. And, and after one year, I noticed that every one of my medical conditions, when I did that, went away either completely or improved. And I, I mean, so dramatically that I felt like a fraud. I felt like such a fake individual, you know, thinking myself as a professional with a doctoral degree. And yet not one minute had I spent in my medical training or my medical career advocating what had the single most dramatic impact on my health in my lifetime, just cutting out processed foods and basically eating clean. So I was so dismayed um, over this experience that I decided that I had to become a researcher 
to take a look at what was behind this dramatic change in my health and my physiology. So I end up uh, joining forces with a uh, physician, a great physician uh, by the name of Dr. Zhang up in Minneapolis. And he, he had a research practice that I joined and worked with him for about seven years. And we ended up uh, applying for a grant for the, for, uh, with the National Science Foundation to study the reversal of chronic disease. And when we set out, we decided that we would look at uh, where there was an absence of chronic disease among species, and that's in animals in the wild. And we, we asked ourselves, what did they eat and how did they exercise? How did they live? to try to figure out interventions to reverse chronic disease. And <clears throat> at the same time, we looked at what could we follow inside the body that would allow us to have a, a metric of sorts to be able to ascertain uh, who was healthy and who was not. So we focused in on visceral fats and we used an MRI to quantify it and evaluate it. And then we looked at different dietary strategies and lifestyle strategies, exercise, numerous different things that impacted visceral fat. And we looked at what you know made it get worse, what made it get better. And after researching it for about uh, eight years, um, we ended up getting a, a grant from the National Science, a $1.2 million grant. And it was just the most interesting research. So I'm happy to share it with uh, some of what we learned uh, from that research with your audience. Before we get into all the nuances, the MRI and things like that, um, can you talk a little bit, like what is visceral fat versus subcutaneous fat? Is that the brown fat, the white fat that we hear a lot about? Can you talk a little bit about these fats, where they're yeah. located, why it matters? Yeah. So people kind of hear about visceral fat as like deep belly fat and people have a kind of a gestalt or feeling, you know, vagueness that it's a bad thing. It's a really bad thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is so bad that every form of chronic disease that we studied among 5,000 over 5,000 individuals went away or got better if they eliminated that visceral fat. So it, it has its tentacles in so many forms of disease. And what that is specifically is a deep type of fat that's within your, your, your uh, abdominal area of your, your belly, deep, deep around your viscera, around your organs. So it surrounds your intestines, your colon, your liver, your deep organs, that you cannot see unless you do an MRI scan or you happen to have a surgery, um, then you could, you could see, you know, if they took photographs of it. Uh, but subcutaneous fat is the kind that people are more familiar with. It's the pinch, uh, the inch kind. So you can pinch it on, on your skin, you can feel that on your abdomen. And that really is not associated with any chronic disease. We didn't see any substantial improvement in health when people reduce their subcutaneous fat nor um, any uh, worsening of their health. But you, you know, the distinction between is white and brown fat, both those fats are really probably more white fat, but brown fat is, is actually healthy fat. And uh, it's typically uh, kind of located within the, the neck regions and the, and the sternal regions and it's in most abundance in babies when they're born. We have a large amount of brown fat and it has, and the reason why it's brown is because it has a higher amount of mitochondria in it. And these mitochondria are very active and they actually promote thermogenesis, so creation of heat. So they help to regulate the heat of babies. So if you accumulate more brown fat, you have greater tolerance for cold. So it's a useful fat and also increased metabolism of other fats. So you actually can burn off um, and have a, have a better, healthier level of metabolism if you have a higher amount of brown fat. And you can actually convert your, brown, your white fat to brown fat, as we're finding out. So great question. I love for you know, people to find out that there are different depots of fat. There are different types of fat. There's also fat around your heart, pericardial fat, fat around your kidney. There's fat that and we'll hopefully get into this fat that invades your muscle tissue, sort of like what you see when you might go to a butcher shop and you see marbling in steak. That's really unhealthy fat. And that corresponds to visceral fat. We see it in humans. And uh, hopefully we have a chance to, to take a look at what that, that appears on an MRI. But yeah, very important questions. Um, you definitely do not want to have visceral fat. Subcutaneous fat just means that you're living, um, you're eating in excess of your metabolic needs. You're consuming more calories than you really need. You're not as efficient as probably you should be. 
Uh, but it's nowhere near as harmful as having visceral fat. And then how do the fats occur? So, you know, it's not like I decide, well, I want more visceral fat over the subcutaneous, or I want more of the white fat over the brown fat. How does that happen? It sounds like some of it's the processed foods, but. All right. So you're asking about processed carbs and their contribution to visceral fat. So it's been our experience when we did this research, again, scanning over 5,000 abdomens, looking at visceral fat and analyzing diet, in particular, doing different uh, specific interventions. So trying out processed carbs and eliminating processed carbs to see their impact on visceral fat. We were able to see, in some cases, just in just um, over a weekend, uh, the deposition of visceral fat from processed carbs. So processed carbs is my highest recommendation for my followers and anybody that I have an opportunity to influence to be a part of like today, uh, being on a nutrition with Judy, I like to make the point of just how important processed carbs are to eliminate from your diet. So uh, maybe, maybe we'll take a look at a uh, picture of uh, processed carbs so you, you, you get an idea of uh, what, they, uh, what their contribution is. So this is a really nice case series of uh, a visceral fat on an individual who's 68 years old. He was an executive and we've colored, visceral fat doesn't really have a natural color, but we've added color through the computer. So you can see uh, the difference between visceral fat and subcutaneous fat. So subcutaneous fat, we painted in yellow and it's the kind of fat that's around your body is pinch, uh, pinch an inch kind. And the visceral fat is the deeper stuff in the middle. So um, what's of significance is the amount of visceral fat this gentleman has, and also the deposition of fat within the oblique muscles. So sure. these dark structures on the side of the muscles, and actually the same process that causes fat uh, to be deposited as visceral fat in the abdomen causes deposition of fat within the muscles. So it's all common a, a fatty uh, inflammatory process. So in two weeks, what's interesting at least to me, that in the untrained eye, so people who are watching this right now sure. can see themselves that the visceral fat has been diminished between right. here and here in just two weeks. And, and actually this view here, it's a little bit bigger. You can see the dimension here is they've gotten a little bit more narrow. And this is by way of orientation, the belly button, and these are the muscles in the back. So this is the vertebral column, but you can see his diameter shrunk from here to here. And then we go a little further down, 15 weeks, 25 weeks, and now at week 35, you can see he's diminished his visceral fat significantly uh, between when he got started 35 weeks earlier and 35 weeks to the end. So his whole shape changed and he actually developed a uh, Judy, a six pack. And what's interesting is that he developed this six pack and lost all this visceral fat from just doing the one thing, cutting out processed carbs. And he did not exercise one minute. So that's why it's really important to emphasize to people that when they have a weight problem or they have health issues, that the priority is eating healthy and not exercise. And that they're deluding themselves into thinking that by just exercising, they're really going to solve the problem. I, I tell them it's like shoveling sand against the tide. If you think that you're going to eliminate those health concerns just by exercising. So uh, another interesting analogy or important point that I picked up is these are the same slides, but now without the color. And I added this red line to emphasize that this is a measurement, okay? So these, you can see that this red line has gotten smaller each time compared to here. So what that means is the diameter of the abdomen laying down. It's called the sagittal abdominal diameter. I like to tell people, Judy, that's a poor man's MRI. I mean, you can infer visceral fat from doing that measurement. So an example of how that measurement can be done is if you lay down on a flat surface mm -hmm. and you take yardsticks, some cases you have to do yardsticks, some cases you can just use a ruler but you, and you do flat across on the abdomen, you can track what that diameter of the abdomen is laying down. And that number can be followed over a period of time. And you'll see that, that you can infer from that without doing an MRI scan that a person is losing visceral fat. And that's really important. I think that's a, it's a really quick and easy way that patients can, and, and your followers and people 
can just track their visceral fat and um, see that it's being eliminated. So um, this is a device you can get off Amazon. It's called a radiology caliper mm -hmm. or an x-ray caliper. It's about $30 and it allows you, to, radiologists use it to, to measure distances on plates behind uh, people that are getting x-rays for various different radiographic studies. But in this case, I recommend adopting, I give it to my, my clients. I buy them one and, and I give it to them so they can track their own sagittal abdominal diameter. So uh, anybody watching can jump on Amazon. I obviously do not have any affiliation with this device or any devices, sure. anything that I recommend. I do not have any financial recommendations, but um, that's a, a really good uh, measurement for tracking and inferring uh, visceral fat. The other way that uh, visceral fat can be increased is through alcohol. So we see people that uh, may cut out processed carbs uh, or might do the other interventions. We studied lots of different things uh, such as sprinting. Sprinting really gets rid of visceral fat uh, as a, a better form of exercise than jogging. But uh, people that have persistent high visceral fat or accumulating visceral fat, even in the absence of eating processed uh, carbs, oftentimes it's from alcohol. So I'll ask them if they're, they're consuming alcohol. And usually it's a, you know, a serious um, alcohol user and they simply need to cut it out. And I, and I show them uh, what's going on and they're able to do it. The other uh, contribution from visceral fat is from stress. So stress causes increased cortisol. Cortisol signals to the body to store uh, fat and very often it is stored as visceral fat. So uh, it can be subcutaneous fat, but oftentimes if it's unhealthy stress, it is going to be uh, deposited within the abdomen as visceral fat. We see that time and time again. And then a, a fourth way that visceral fat is, is accumulate, accumulates within the abdomen and or its dissipation elimination is, is interfered with is uh, from sleep impairment. So if you're not sleeping well, you're just going to get a lot of a, a resistance to getting rid of your visceral fat or you're gonna accumulate it. So um, here's a case of a guy um, who had a huge amount of visceral fat uh, within, within him. And this is, I like to show this scan to let people know how important visceral fat is to image rather than just getting numbers. So if you can afford to get a dental MRI uh, or CT of your abdomen to track your visceral fat, I recommend it. Because um, when you get a number like in a lab test, we, you know, we, uh, we get lab tests to help patients out. You know, I, over the years, I, I've done so many of them after 25 years of practice in medicine, but it's really rare that I get anybody motivated to do anything with a lab test, but it's extraordinary, the motivation that comes from a visceral fat scan. So when you look at it in cross section. And, and th that's the reason why DEXA scan, I think is basically almost a waste of money because the DEXA scan doesn't really allow you to visualize your visceral fat. It gives you a number. So it's just like a lab study, but when you can see the amount of visceral fat that you have in you, um, it, it just engages your, your cerebral cortex, your brain in such a profound way that it helps you to overcome you know, the, the resistance to change and really motivates you. So in this case, this guy, I showed him healthy levels of visceral fat, and then I showed him unhealthy levels of visceral fat, and then I showed him his scan, and he literally, Judy, passed out on me. He passed out and hit the ground, knocked over wow. two chairs. The nurses came running in. It, it, was, a, it was a really uh, powerful impact. And so you know, I, thousands of people, I've just opened up their, their abdominal MRI scans and shared their image with them. And uh, it's just really a moving experience for them to see um, this enemy inside of them, how much oftentimes they have such significant amount of visceral fat inside. So uh, whenever possible, I encourage people to have abdominal um, MRIs to, to track that image and to actually uh, visualize it because it has, uh, has such, such a good effect. So maybe I'll just take time to show a nice MRI. This is a good mm -hmm. MRI. This guy has visceral fat here, the white inside, but not much. He's, he's only uh, 27 years old. He's got a six pack. He's got nice oblique muscles, very, very small uh, amount of visceral fat. So he's, he's a good example. People want to know what, what, what a good example of a uh, MRI is. 
And then a couple other really nice ones. So this is an NFL player, 23 year old professional NFL player. Um, just a little bit of visceral fat that he has. And this area down here is actually not visceral fat. This is retroperitoneal fat around the kidney. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not within the viscera, but this is the best scan. If people want to know what the gold standard is, what you want to look like, if you get scanned uh, for the type A's in your audience that might be listening to this, uh, this is it. And wow. his visceral fat is just this little bit up here. Um, it's just it's a very, very small amount that he has. And this is not uh, visceral fat. We see this in, in really healthy people. But what's also noteworthy besides his, his paucity or a lack of visceral fat is the abundance of musculature. So mm -hmm. The other advantage an MRI gives is the ability to quantify, you know, muscle to fat ratios. So we can see how much fat and how much muscle um, is present. And this guy has a little bit of subcutaneous fat. This is his belly button. That's why it's dark there. This is his belly button here, uh, but he is mostly um, muscle. So he's right. wall to wall muscle. And this is his core. If anybody is you know, listening and wondered what their core looked like when you do those exercises. This is the core musculature, the psoas muscles, and they're, he's literally kissing uh, from his back to his front, all, all muscles to his abdominus rectus and, uh, you know, the biggest uh, muscles uh, possible. So that's a really nice example, an introduction to MRI and visceral fat uh, to, to grasp and understand just how much and how important it is to, um, to, to track your, your visceral fat. And one other, I mentioned sprinting one other uh, minute, we'll just take a look at a client who is 58 years old, who had a lot, a fair amount of visceral fat. And he came back and he was, I was disappointed that he hadn't removed more visceral fat. That's still a fair amount of visceral fat in there. And he assured me he wasn't drinking and he wasn't cheating. So it wasn't eating processed carbs. He was eating, you know, foods in whole form, um, eating healthy. And uh, he said he wasn't having stress and he, he was sleeping fine, but he admitted to one thing that we had asked him uh, to cut out and that was uh, distance running. So he was a distance runner. Like I was, I used to be a distance runner. He was running uh, more than I was actually. He was running 10 miles a day wow. uh, for five days a week. So 50 miles of running, that's a, a good healthy amount of uh, distance running uh, on a weekly basis. So we finally persuaded him, look, you're in a, in a study for the National Science Foundation, and, and we really need you to, to stop running because it's part of the protocol that we look at high intensity, the, the impact of high intensity exercise uh, when a low, uh, low carbohydrate diet. And so he agreed to, so he stopped running here. And then in two months, it was even less than two months, he came back and what he did was sprinted between here and here. He stopped running and he only sprinted. So this is the, the significant impact that sprinting has when you start sprinting and you stop distance running. So we saw this time and time again. And so it, be, it became a regular protocol, one of our strategies that we continue to this day to recommend to people to make sure that they um, continue to um, uh, sprint and not do uh, distance running. So um, I may take a look at one other slide that shows some distance running uh, that uh, some right here, a client, uh, whoops, that doesn't show up so good, but all this red is visceral fat. Mm -hmm. And he had very little subcutaneous fat around. And this is a marathoner who was running eight to 10 marathons uh, a year. So you can see he's had a, a fair amount of visceral visceral fat in there. But what was also significant is how much uh, sub uh, pericardial fat he had. So this is the right lung and the left lung here. And the middle is the heart. And we can quantify that fat, a uh, large chunk of fat around his heart. So he was a young marathoner, 34 years old, and had a significant amount of visceral fat. So from these images, we were able to persuade him um, to, to cut out the distance running and to become a sprinter. And the 68 year old guy that uh, Judy cut out the carbohydrates, the processed foods, but wasn't going to do any running or sprinting for us or any exercise, he didn't exercise one minute. This was his heart. So he too had a big chunk mm. of fat, even larger chunk of fat around his heart and not in 35 weeks, but just 13 weeks. So really just uh, three months, he came back and look how much he had diminished his pericardial fat on his repeat scan. So uh, pericardial fat 
is commensurate with and corresponds to your amount of visceral fat right. that you have. So I think it's really important for people to image their visceral fat. And, and for those who are listening, say, God, you know, I don't know what my visceral fat would be like. I'd like to know. Well, if you've ever had an abdominal CT, so here's, so in this scan, you know, for your viewers, and I really, this is so exciting. I really want them to go back and and see if they've ever had abdominal CT, because you can see at least at that point in time in your life, what your visceral fat was at, at that time. So on a CT, abdominal CT, visceral fat shows up as black. So all of this black Judy is visceral fat. So on an MRI, it shows up as white visceral fat. On a CT, it shows up as black. So this person has a large amount of visceral fat within them. So yeah, go back. You can go to where this, the abdominal CT was. Either you did it through a doctor or through a hospital, and you can request that, and you can get the report. And I guarantee that nobody commented about the visceral fat. Right. It's it's there. It's it it cause it's causally connected to the biggest killers uh, today: atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and strokes, and cancer. And nobody comments on it. It's an abomination. It's a scourge afflicting our healthcare system. And there's something really, really rotten about the fact that this sails right through. So that's why I want to educate doctors that are in training. And I want to train nutritionists. I want to train health coaches. I want to train people to read their own abdominal CTs, their own abdominal MRIs to look at that visceral fat, because Currently, it's not being done. And so that's why I'm super glad to be on Nutrition <laughs> with Judy and uh, be able to show you know, just how important the uh, visceral fat is. Yeah. And there's so many questions. So one, can we go to a regular doctor and get these scans? Um, would a, our standard doctor, if I said, I want to get an MRI on my abdomen area just to get check visceral fat, would they even do that? Is it covered by insurance? Do I have to go to a specialist? Yeah. So great questions. You can go to your doctor. You can request it. It won't be covered by insurance. Okay. Unfortunately, insurance companies are not at all interested in imaging visceral fat. In fact, they don't want uh, at a, the highest levels. It won't, won't be discussed with the low levels, but at the highest levels, they're not going to do anything that promotes awareness of visceral fat because uh, so we every form of chronic disease we ever saw in 5,000 people went away or got better when visceral fat was eliminated. Do you know how much money we're talking uh, to the healthcare industry, the largest part of our economy, right. if we were able to eliminate chronic disease? And it's really starting with just eliminating visceral fat. So the health, health insurance companies are not going to do that. For those viewers, who, well, why not? They got to pay for all those bills. Here's why. Nobody in the health industry wants disease to go away. The reason is the more disease, the higher you're willing to pay for your health insurance. That's why health insurance keeps going up. More disease, they can charge more for it. They make their money on the policy, how much people are paying annually or on a monthly basis for that health, health insurance. So even, it's even, United Health Group talks about it all the time to business, member payment per month, members payment per month. That's all they're tracking. That you know, some more disease, they they can get more money out of it. So the character uh, mayhem on all state inc insurance TV commercials, that guys, mm -hmm. like, you know, when there's mayhem out there, you'll buy insurance for your car. But when there's no mayhem and we have driverless operating systems and there are no car crashes, automobile insurance is going to drop to almost next to nothing. And these auto insurance industries are already trying to figure out what they're going to do. Uh, once we do that, because we're looking, you know, realistic for the first time in our country's history where nobody will die from car accidents in the future uh, because uh, driverless operating systems are going to are going to change that. Well, if if visceral fat gets out there and people become aware of this, it's going to so dramatically cut the cost of chronic disease that health insurance is going to dramatically cost drop the cost of it. And a lot of people aren't even going to get it because they'll just take the risk of, you know, how, you know, they'll buy minimal coverage or something for trauma or, or something like that. But yeah, that's, that's, a, that's what I try to do is bring awareness to visceral fat. And for those that want to go to their doctor and try to get a, vis, a, a, a abdominal MRI scan to track visceral fat, 
they can see if their doctor will order it, but they're going to have to pay out of pocket. You know, these and sh these MRI scans cost anywhere from a thousand to twenty five hundred dollars across the country. But if you pay cash out of pocket, sometimes you can go and get it. Like I can get it for my clients for for five hundred dollars. Uh, so, you know, if you're able to get a discounted cash rate, pay for it out of pocket. Don't look for insurance to to cover it. it won't be covered. And uh, if you can't get it, they can contact me. And I'll, I'll be glad to try to see if I can get them an MRI scan here in, uh, in Minnesota. But um, yeah, you're going to you're going to have to pay out of pocket health HSA accounts, health savings accounts can can cover this, too. So a lot of um, a lot of times I, I tell people to use their HSAs to their MRI scans or their CT scans. If you know, if you if you ever have a CT, I had one in the past or you get one in the future make sure you get a look at it and get that visceral fat red. Yeah, I think this is really powerful, especially people that aren't willing to change their diet because of some markers, right? Like maybe their cholesterol is imbalanced or their A1C doesn't look so good. And they're just like, well, I just want to live in moderation and have some carbs and processed foods and I'm just living, right? And But if they see images, which it's interesting because I've been looking into how to make a, a, like a talk more powerful. And they talk about a lot of these books and podcasts, they talk about how images are the most powerful way to convey a message more than data yeah. points and facts and numbers. And, um, and so it's so fascinating that I can see a family member, maybe like, maybe I'm carnivore and I am healing a lot, but my husband isn't. And so maybe if I just take a picture of his visceral fat, it'll be enough to move the needle to motivate someone to change because you have a baseline of what should look healthy versus what theirs looks like. And that makes a lot of sense. I wanted to ask you about, um, I just wanted to make sure and be clear for the people listening and watching, but you brought up processed carbs. So what do you consider processed carbs? Um, is it all carbohydrates? Is it, um, you know, like what, what is that in the diet? And then in terms of alcohol, um, when you say they're drinking a lot, what does that mean? And I think it makes sense why alcohol will be just as impactful as processed foods because they're broken down in the same, that fructose model, they're broken down in the same way. And it absolutely makes sense why alcohol will impact it just the same. Yeah. So we'll start with alcohol because it's nice and simple. If somebody really has never had a problem with alcohol, never had any issue, you better be honest with yourself. And if anybody has ever told you, you got a problem with alcohol, you better believe them. Okay. So if they've never had any problem with alcohol, then a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon might be okay. That's what I do a tiny bit. Uh, mm -hmm. I pair it with sometimes with some steak. And when I say a little bit, I'm talking like uh, a quarter cup to half, a, a quarter glass to half glass of red Cabernet Sauvignon. That's the lowest carbohydrates out there. Okay. But for my clients, any of them have ever had a problem with alcohol, I just, it's time to stop it. I mean, you, you, you've hit your liver enough. We can see the fatty liver disease and cirrhosis Oftentimes it's present within it and on their MRI scan. So we just tell them to cut it out. And, uh, but yeah, absolutely no other alcohol other than the lowest form of uh, carbohydrates. And then with, re you know, regard to processing of foods, the best example I give is chunks of vegetables and chunks of meat. That's, that's what you can eat. Anything that's changed in form and that leaves, uh, you know, eliminates a lot of stuff, you know, processing is just so ubiquitous. Even cauliflower rice, you know, taking cauliflower mm -hmm. and grinding it up, you know, causes it to, to raise your blood sugars yeah. faster and higher than if you eat cauliflower in whole form. So, you know, processing is, is something as, as easy as just grinding something up and, and it's exposed to air uh, as a consequence. Uh, and so it, it just, it has a higher capacity for being more inflammatory and uh, to spike your blood sugars higher and to have a higher insulinogenic response, higher levels of insulin. So, you know, I tell people that they can, you know, they can, that besides doing visceral fat, I, I wear a uh, CGM and they're, they're super popular. I've, I've had mine for almost five years now. And so uh, I've got lots of experience and I don't wear it all the time. I, I, I just, I'd like to study and I like to give it to my new clients so they can see that. But if uh, for those that, you know, are currently listening, you can get a CGM and you can talk to your doctor about prescribing you one. Mm -hmm. I prescribe them for my clients. 
And that will give them helpful insights about processed foods um, in addition to um, having visceral fat. And, you know, with an MRI scan, we can scan, you know, every day. I mean, I used to have my own scanner when we had, when we were doing the study for the National Science Foundation. And we would scan people, you know, sometimes every day and track, you know, the influence on rice, you know, so rice is processed because oftentimes they remove the skin, the outer surface of, of rice to make it white. And even wild rice is still problematic and, and still bumps blood sugar. So I, I basically, especially the whites, potatoes and things like that and rice, um, I, tell, I tell them to cut it out. And my, my preference is eating vegetables, the, the lowest form and, and really the best lowest form of carbohydrates, lowest glycemic index are fermented vegetables. So I eat meats and I eat, uh, I like fermented vegetables as a garnish, not as a huge, huge amount, but I like to garnish um, my meals with some, you know, some kimchi or some natto uh, or some, you know, kvass or some fermented sauerkraut. I, I find that uh, it pairs well. Sure. And I just feel better. If I eat consume meat without those, I, I don't feel as good. Like tonight I'm breaking my fast. I've been fasting for 72 hours. So mm-hmm. I'll go to an all you can eat Brazilian churrascaria restaurant. And I will bring like three or four little bottles of ferments and and some uh, some other probiotic, uh, you know, I bring coconut vinegar and, and apple cider vinegar and add it to some uh, San Pellegrino water. And that's, that's what I'll drink. And I, I will feel fantastic. But if I don't bring those things and I eat a bunch of meat, I don't feel as good. So it sounds like what you mean by processed carbs are basically carbohydrates or foods that are really increasing your blood sugar, which when then have an insulogenic effect. So the goal is really to not have those effects. And that is really what you're encompassing as processed carbs. Is that correct? That is correct. So okay. most of the time when you have that spike, when you process uh, carbohydrates and you get that uh, bump in the blood sugars and the um, bump in, uh, in insulin where it's s- sustained over a period of time, mm-hmm. you'll see that contribution, uh, that deposition of, of visceral fat being laid down in the abdomen. There are people, interestingly enough, that can consume processed carbohydrates and don't spike their blood sugar and they don't get visceral fat. Okay. So there's an interesting study out of Israel that gave people chocolate brownies with icing and they uh, tested people for their blood sugars. And not surprisingly, most people's blood sugars went up. But in one, in some cases, individuals' blood sugars did not go up. They did not have a, a glucogenic uh, blood sugar response or an ins- in, uh, response in their, their insulin um, that could be measured. And so what they found was they cited, it was a microbiome study. They looked at, they sequenced the gut microbiome and they found common to those individuals that didn't raise their blood sugar, <laughs> certain specific microbes. And um, it wasn't a causation study. It was an association study. Uh, so the next next phase of that study will be able to take those microbes, give it to people that were having previous blood sugar spikes to see if it conferred protective benefit. Now, from this study, I have heard it's not working. And the reason is these microbes are so delicate right. that it, they cannot get this to, to work. It's only in vivo that mm-hmm. these microbes that live within the gut. So nature is best. It doesn't look like we're going to anytime soon get a probiotic uh, of made of those particular microbes that, that's going to provide a protective benefit from glucose. So don't hold your breath. If you're listening to this, say, oh, there you go. I'm just going to wait for those microbes. Um, the probiotic, uh, you want to start eliminating those processed foods now and just start eating food in whole form. And, uh, but in the meantime, I'm really big on the microbiome. I really Mm -hmm. encourage people um, to spend a lot of time educating my clients on the microbiome to start living a life that is conducive to optimizing their microbiome as much as possible so that they can derive some of the tremendous benefit. And I think that's an area that physicians, um, health coaches, nutritionists, you know, therapists online in the health community have not done a good enough job selling people on the microbiome, the incredible mm-hmm. role it plays and the important role, because we still are in the infancy about it and we don't right. know as much about it, but you know, that doesn't mean you can't benefit from it now. You know, you don't want to wait to be a late adopter, early adopters are getting involved in uh, reading about the microbiome, understanding it and making healthier choices so that they can begin today uh, benefiting from a healthier microbiome. Yeah, I would have to agree. Um, I focus on root cause healing and I start with a carnivore cures meat only elimination diet. And the reason is 
I mean, all disease starts with the gut. If you don't have good gut microbiome, the whole digestive process is broken. You don't have the proper building blocks. You don't have the nutrients that can be assimilated. So I fully agree with gut healing. And that's where I think a lot of people that eat meat only should challenge themselves over time and test foods like certain vegetables, certain, I guess, fermented foods, not that you want to eat it all the time or that you have to, but just to test how is your resiliency with health. And so that's why you should try other foods. And if you feel fine, but you're choosing to not eat it, that's a whole different thing than if you're sensitive to certain foods. So I'm completely on the same page with you. I have one question. So you were yeah. bringing up that the marathon running wasn't ideal compared to the sprinting. Is it because the stress of marathon running is too much for the body? Like why is? Yeah. Yeah. So what is it about marathon running? Yeah, it is, I was encouraged to see that uh, Paul Saladino, carnivore MD on uh, Instagram, he just recently came out with a posting and he took some heat from it, um, okay. you know, criticizing, he was critical of uh, distance running and, and was a, a supporter. And I, when I was on with him on his, on his podcast, as a guest, we talked about sprinting. We went through some of those mm -hmm. slides, how incredibly beneficial. So I guess Paul is, is taking to heart, you know, the, the importance of uh, sprinting. But what it seems to be is that when you exercise, you generate a, a reactive oxygen species, mm -hmm. ROSs. And these ROS molecules go through the body and they cause, ha they wreak havoc. So there is a sweet spot for exercise. Nobody really knows exactly what that is. But when you exercise too much, and now we, you know, more and more, we're finding that you can exercise too much. There is, you know, the, the capacity for humans to overexercise. You stress your body and all this oxidative damage comes as a result of that. And when you sprint, you don't generate as much ROS is because it's a shorter duration. So the exact mechanism for this to happen has not been uh, well established by studies. So I just issued that as a caveat that we don't really know, but it's it's probably related to ROSs. And then somebody else is uh, Dr. Uh, O'Keefe. I think his first name is uh, James O'Keefe, who, who's a cardiologist. And he was recently on with Dr. Peter Atia, um, uh, Peter Atia is uh, the drive, and uh, Dr. Keith has uh, done YouTube videos and uh, TED Talks, and so he's a cardiologist who's warning about durational exercise, particularly distance running, and the harm that he's seen uh, in hearts, and we've all had experiences where we've heard about people that are, you know, marathoners that suddenly drop dead of a heart attack. Jim Fix was one of the first back in the 70s when uh, where marathon running was just at its infancy. But uh, yeah, I think there really is something to it. And uh, I'm awfully glad. I'm very happy that I gave up distance running uh, to do sprinting exercise. And you would have a really tough time getting me to go back. But I, uh, I was a very serious distance runner and I loved the endorphins that were provided me and I, it made me feel so good. And I thought it was causing me a lot of benefit, but I was, uh, I was a, ch a chubby guy. I was overweight when I was out there, uh, running. And so now I realize, you know, scanning all these, you can see, um, lots of soccer moms and gyms all across the country jogging on treadmills, uh, trying to lose weight. And, um, I oftentimes want to go and say, Hey, get off that treadmill and just sprint outdoors, save your money, just sprint, cut out processed foods. You got this, but you know, it's kind of unwelcome advice, but for the, for your listeners today, that's what I recommend. Do high intensity exercise, very short brief. And I like to like to say that, you know, if you look back over the existence of homo sapiens for four years, mm -hmm. there really was only two kinds of exercise or physical, you know, uh, events that really played a significant role in making us healthy and keeping us in the gene pool. And those two were how fast you could run to catch an animal, to kill it, need it, and how fast you could run to get away from an animal or predator that was trying to kill you. So as a defensive measure. So, um, and the, the other, so besides sprinting, the other really important physical trait you want to have it, it relates to that is fighting. So how strong and how well you could fight to kill a prey so that you had a source of food or how well you could defend yourself or your offspring or your, your fellow uh, clansmen, tribal, you know, pack people, whatever we called ourselves back then. So it's really fighting and sprinting. 
And of course, I can't recommend to, to people to go out and get in a bar fight, but you can exercise very intensely, uh, kind of emulating what a fight might like be like. And it's it's really high, highly intense in a very short period of time. And, uh, you know, uh, MMA fighters and boxers kind of know this, but you know, I, I was a former police officer and I once had a fight for my life with a bad guy that I, I really thought I was dying. I was going to die. And it was only about three minutes, but that was unlike anything in my life, those three minutes. And I realized that we just don't exercise like that. But that, Judy, was the life of our ancestors for 4 million years, right. those kind of struggles. And so we've just got away from this high intensity form of exercise. And so I try to tell that story to get my, my clients to really understand just how significant they need to, to really exercise. I can barely breathe. I think I'm on the verge of death when I, when I do my workouts and my wife can't even look at me. <laughs> she can't be in the room. So it's very short and very, very intense. And then I recover. So you really want to make sure that you're getting that high intensity exercise. In. Yeah, that's good. And I, I do think though, that if someone just never exercises and they're maybe out of shape, maybe they should work up to that so that it's not a shock on their heart and their system. Oh but, yeah. Yeah. But in my research with my carnivore cure book, I found the same thing. So marathoners tend to have more health issues. Um, I know that I think in the book, I mentioned that um, their immune system gets really taxed through the whole uh, marathon process. And so right after oftentimes they get sick. And so it's not ideal to be doing these like CrossFit type of exercises all the time, like seven days a week, working out that hard. Our bodies aren't wired to do that much level of exercise and uh, just consistently. And so I actually argue that it's not ideal to do that type of exercise as well in the book. And it's has uh, ramifications for optimal health. So I Super. completely agree with you. Super interesting. And in fact, I think there was some, uh, studies that attempted to look at the correlation to bad outcome deaths with mm -hmm. uh, during COVID and distance running marathons. Oh, interesting. And so that was seen um, in, in some studies. Um, and, and so there is there, there has been some of that. I think we're going to learn a lot about, about health and disease and lifestyle uh, looking at COVID if we you know, dare to look at it correctly and, and we're bold and we're honest with ourselves about it. But, you know, the running crowd is similar to, um, uh, I find the passion, but sometimes the passion can be too much and you, you lose your open-mindedness. And so I often find distance runners very passionate mm -hmm. and resistant to the notion that they, they that maybe shouldn't be running long distance and maybe they should just be short. So you know, just I tell your your listeners to keep an open mind, and I see that same kind of passion and closed mindedness sometimes uh, within the vegan community up uh, with regard to meat. You know, just write it off and be close headed. So, as scientists, you know, we want to keep an open mind, and I always reserve the right to change my mind about things. But you know, I uh, I, I do see that you know the passion sometimes in some some groups of people, you know, includes the distance runners, can interfere with the notion, but give it a try. Like you start your clients recommending going on, on the ultimate elimination diet, which is just eating meat initially. And by the way, I do the same thing. And then I add in, I add, add in the ferments uh, down the road. If they just give cut out distance running, give sprinting uh, a try, I think they'll find that they really like it and it grows on them. And your point is well taken. You know, everybody listening needs to be cleared by their physician to make sure that they're well enough to exercise um, you don't want to just go out and, and uh, you know, head, head first into high intensity exercise. Right. If you've never eased into it, you want to, you want to go ahead and do that. But now, unlike, uh, uh, unlike exercise, you can go head first and cut out, yes. you know, processed carbs. I think you still have to be uh, cautious about, you know, carbohydrate elimination and uh, the fact that you're dependent on carbs and you get some of this flu, but, you know, keto flu and some of the kind of symptoms that you can find that are associated with people studying carbs are, are fairly benign and people can get through it, except for the ones who go through it and have a bad experience and give up and simply say, oh, I, you know, I tried eliminating, uh, I tried going keto and I tried just eating meat and, and it just wasn't right for me. So I, I like to throw some caution on people and make sure they they get support from other people, get involved in other communities that uh, that are doing that to help them uh, derive support. Because uh, yeah, there's so much at stake with health optimization. You know, getting yourself health, healthy. That we don't want to lose 
um, through a discouraging experience, somebody who would otherwise become healthy and they just give up because oftentimes when they give up, they try to love it, they end up being way worse than if they'd never tried. It's really a sad, sad situation. And I'd, I'd agree with that. And that's why I even challenge within the carnivore community, some of the ideologies, like, for example, I think eating too much liver is not always ideal because you can have excess nutrition. And I like to challenge because I have clients that I work with one-on-one -on -one where eating more liver was not an ideal thing. And so I think for every single person, the answer to what exactly works for their diet will differ. And we should be open because that's how we'll progress in science and finding avenues and ways for people to heal. And so if someone doesn't do well on a ketogenic diet, I do think they should maybe work with someone to figure out what do they need to alter, what maybe they need to add back in and other things like that, but not just to give up because they followed one person's dogma or one yeah. community's dogma, because it might have been something else. No, it's so true. And I'm always learning, you know, I uh, just the other day, I was listening to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Chaffee and uh, who, uh, Chaffee and D, Andrew Chaffee and D, um, he's on uh, Instagram, and he was given a talk about, you know, this very point, you know, consuming too many uh, animal organs, he, he just eats really skeletal muscle and right. uh, and, and meat and, and doesn't eat uh, organs. Yes. Quite a few people in the carnivore community uh, eat a lot of organs. Uh, but Dr. Chaffee made this interesting point about the Inuit because they live basically a, an all meat diet and they don't, sure. there's no plants up there for them to eat. Um, but they apparently do not eat any organs. Mm -hmm. They just eat, they just eat the, the, the muscle and they throw the organs to their uh, the huskies dogs. and things yeah. like that. So, yeah, I think, I think we have to look into that. Um, I do know that you you can be, get vitamin toxicosis from a polar bear, a gallbladder. So I remember a fascinating case report about that in, in medical school. So that is possible. But you know you don't have to go to the extent of being toxic. You know right. what about the the, the cumulative effect right. of constantly being exposed to these toxins? I think it it is uh, you know basically the case that, you know, meat by far has a lot less toxins than probably plants and vegetables. There's, there's, I think a far greater concern, but we ought not to be too dismissive about that and just think it, oh, it's, it's only meat and, you know, you can eat any kind of meat. Um, no, I think there's uh, something to be said about um, the sources of the meat that you're eating and, and organs. In terms of carbohydrates, um, I know you, we keep saying process, but you shared it, I think it was on Instagram, but you shared a person that was eat, wasn't really eating processed foods. I think it was maybe a little bit of almond butter, which I guess technically can be considered processed, but it was a little bit of honey and maybe some rice. And that was enough to cause visceral fat. Do you have the image and can you share a little bit about that story? Sure, sure. So I'll, I'll uh, do a little screen share. This was him uh, initially, you know, eating uh, rice and uh, honey and uh, almond butter. And uh, this is him five months later wow. uh, when he eliminated those things. And, you know, to be fair, you know, he, um, he started sprinting and, and I think he, you know, did some fasting too, which, you know, had a, had a, a contribution um, in that, but we should look at his scan. So this is his, geez, I, this is his initial scan. He has a fair amount of visceral fat here. Mm -hmm. But what I want to show you now is I have a side by side. Here's the side by side image now of uh, this particular client. And this was him um, prior to uh, while, while he was still uh, consuming the almond butter, rice and honey. And this is him from eliminating it. So you can see, and this is just five months difference. His abdomen is a lot uh, flatter on the top part. So he doesn't have uh, and, and this distance, the sagittal abdominal diameter has become smaller. So you can see his stomach is not sticking up as much. And so he's eliminated um, in this particular view. So this was his, his original scan. And at the same time, this image was taken, we scanned through his legs. And this is, this is what's interesting. When we scan through his legs, look at all the white fatty infiltrates that are present within his legs. So this is an example of how um, fatty infiltrates develop within the musculature and they correspond to the amount of visceral fat that you have. So I'm going to return and take a look uh, at a good example so you can see what good healthy legs look like in an individual that has very low levels of visceral fat in it. It's the 
uh, the individual that had the lowest amount of visceral fat we ever saw, right. um, which was just real quick, um, click on it for viewers, this view right here. Um, let's look at, for the sake of the your audience, what his legs look like as an example of how how your legs should see. see. Oh, wow. So he has almost no uh, fatty infiltrates when this, the, this is like filet mignon, okay? So this is just really, really beautiful uh, muscles all around. He doesn't even have a subcutaneous fat within his legs. And I will show you his image uh, because he's given me permission. He is an Olympic sprinter. And so he gave me permission to show his image. Um, he's at Matadi on Instagram. If anybody wants to follow Emmanuel Matadi, just goes by at Matadi, M-A-T-A-D-I. But he has, uh, in this particular image, he had never lifted weights, um, had never he did pull-ups or push-ups. He's he got these big arms and chest just from sprinting and this tight little abdomen, you know, with no visceral fat and the most amount of muscle uh, that you could possibly have down there. And, uh, and these uh, really, really healthy legs uh, filled with muscle. Um, but a good image to kind of get people to understand the impact of uh, these fatty, fatty infiltrates within the muscle can be um, not only gleaned from the amount of the visceral fat that people have. In this case, you can get an idea just from steak. Mm -hmm. So, you know, getting these, the, these images from your grass-fed steak and, and a grain-fed steak, you see this uh, processed carbs of grains, and they oftentimes give cows even uh, molasses. Right. Uh, it causes this deposition because they're trying to increase look how much bigger the steak is the size so that because the profit is in the weight of the animal. So it doesn't really matter if it's fat uh, or muscle, if it's healthy or not, but you want to be eating healthy food. And if you're eating an animal, you want to be eating an animal that ate healthy food. So you got to get an animal that ate a species specific diet. That's why I like wild game feed because they typically you know, eat a healthy diet unless they get into a farmer's field and start eating a bunch of corn. Uh, oftentimes wild game is, is really healthy. And then, you know, an interesting insight that I'll share with you and, and your audience is with regard to, to uh, fruits and, and even vegetables. So I, one of my favorite walks to do in Minneapolis is, is an untouched piece of track of land that nobody can do anything on. And it's next to the University of Minnesota Arboretum. And when I walk out there, there's wild grapes and wild uh, plums and uh, uh, other different types of fruit. And they're really teeny, teeny, tiny. They're super small. And I used to think that, um, that these were from, uh, you know, that they were just completely wild, you know, 5,000 years ago. Now I think that they're actually hybridized seeds or, you know, mm -hmm maybe even GMO or seeds that came from the University of Minnesota Arboretum next to it, that birds dropped in there and they're just growing wild in there. But here's my point. The fruit is really small. It's meant to be really big. So why is it really small? Resilience, the hermetic experience of a uh, fruit bearing tree, uh, fruit bearing vines, grapes and whatever, blackberries, that never get cultivated. They're not watered. They're not fertilized. They're not treated with anything. And so they're rugged and small and, and, and tough. And though the resilience that those plants go through make them more really much more healthier. So that's sort of like a cow or um, that's only fed grass eating what it's supposed to or deer eating what it's supposed to. It's just not going to be these big, massive CAFO, com, you know, confined animal feeding operation animals that fed all this nasty stuff. So it's kind of an analogy I like to point out is maybe all these plants and vegetables that are monocropped and cultivated and are fat and big sugar bombs and filled with all sorts of stuff are not what we're supposed to be eating. We're supposed to be eating the wild things. So I give that example, this example comes, comes down to resilience. And there's a term in anthropology, we study evolution called selection pressure. And so selection pressure was this influence on humans that caused us to become better because we would be, you know, survival of the fittest. We would be eliminated from the species, unable to contribute to the gene pool unless we were really healthy. And so we knew our survival depended upon us catching that animal 
in many cases to be able to, to live in a, in a famine situation or whatever, and to be very careful not be killed at any moment's notice, we could be killed by a predator, in many cases of another human being. So we had this force on nature that always caused us to want to be the very best and very healthiest we could be to fight off and defend and get away from threats and contend with threats. We have none of these threats today, Judy, right. none of them. They're just not around. I mean, accidents happen, yeah, but not, not to the degree that we had before. So selection pressure is no longer a factor in our lives to make us excellent. So I like to say and point out selection pressure has been replaced with selection pleasure. Comfortable homes, heating, air conditioning, couches, TV, tasty foods, nothing we got to think about, nothing we have to worry about. And so the absence of selection pressure being replaced by selection pleasure is a big role why we have the highest amount of disease that we've ever seen in the history of homo sapiens presently today. And it's why our life expectancy continues to drop uh, for the first time, I think for the past three years, it's dropped. Um, and it's not just COVID, uh, it, it really dropped uh, one or two years before COVID showed up. Uh, and it, it's because of our level of disease, just how uh, unhealthy we are. Um, our our conventional health care just can't keep up with it. So that's why I am into health optimization, get people as, as healthy as possible. And it's through um, you know resilience and healthy eating uh, that you become the best biological version of yourself. Have you seen people that eat, you know, mostly whole foods and then maybe they're eating too many fruits or honey and they're still showing visceral fat? Yeah, it, it does go on. And, and it's because they still have that in there. And the, the sweetness, here's, here's, here's what I think happens with people that continue to do it. There's this fondness for, for sugar. And, and uh, you know, some people say it's addiction. Some, some studies show it's addiction. Some studies challenge that it's, that it's really not addiction. Here's what I think is going on that we don't have good analysis of and good radar. I think it's the microbiome. Mm -hmm. So let me suggest to you to think about, and your clients out there, if you are somebody or you have a client that's like this, that they cannot stop eating this sweet stuff, or maybe it's, it's not even sweet stuff, it's bread uh, or it's pasta, or it's something they know that they should give up, but they cannot stop eating it. My strongest belief, the reason why that happens is better explained, not through an addiction model, that they're really addicted to it. My explanation for this is I believe they are infected. They are infected with a species of microbes that are completely dependent upon that particular food that this person continues to crave and keeps eating. And so that particular species or species of microbes have simple carbohydrates as an essential macronutrient for their survival. They existed prior to Homo sapiens arrival on earth. They previously occupied uh, the gastrointestinal tracts of animals. Then they migrated into humans. Mm -hmm. And when they migrated in humans and always within the, the, the gastrointestinal tract of animals, they have to be able to wire, be wired into, they figured out how to wire themselves into and to influence the guests, their host rather, that they're a guest within, so that they get the food that they need. But um, what you want to do, the goal in life is get the healthiest microbes in you, get rid of those that are what I call obesogenic. Mm -hmm. We term microbes that cause obesity, obesity generating microbes, obesogenic. You want to eliminate those and you eliminate them. And if you have these kind of cravings for certain foods, simply stop eating them. And then you got to replace them with good microbes. And that's why I recommend eating probiotic fermented foods right. to uh, introduce a lot of healthy species of microbes, more bacteroides and less firmicutes uh, within the, in, into the microbiome and a greater diversity of these, these microbes in there. And they have to continue it's been my experience. They have to continue to eat this. Otherwise they're going to yo-yo. So if they, people, lots of people lose weight, they change their microbiome. And then one day they shop at Walmart or Target, or they go to the airport and they touch a door, they touch their face, 
those obesogenic microbes from somebody else go back into their gut and then they get those cravings again. So you got to keep eating good probiotic food. And I don't recommend probiotic supplements, probiotic food uh, to keep those, those microbes away. And then I see people uh, that have these addictions to honey and fruit and uh, rice and uh, pasta and cereal that goes away. I was one of those people. I learned to make fudge. My mom taught me to make fudge when I was six years old with a candy thermometer. Oh, I mean, wow. what a wicked thing to do to a kid. It's amazing to have teeth. I do. I haven't lost any of my teeth, um, except for wisdom teeth. But that that had such a, a powerful influence on me. I became addicted to sweet things and ice cream and pasta and bread. And uh, now I have no cravings. I have zero cravings. I crave meats and I crave uh, fermented, you know, kimchi when I eat meat. But yeah, I don't, I don't have any cravings for anything um, processed, anything unhealthy anymore. Yeah, I, I really think it depends on the person because I focus on the gut. Um, and oftentimes some of my clients can't do the fermented foods because let's say they have an overgrowth of candida or some type of yeast or fungus, they can't eat fermented foods. So all of the sauerkraut, the kimchi, all of that's off the table, even bone broth can feed some of those microbes. And so th they may have to go the uh, probiotic route. And I, I agree. I think when you are changing your diet, you may have to switch your, the, the microbiome, right? Things will switch. But I do think there are people that are also addicted to sugars because it's not, um, you know, we have five senses and some, maybe sometimes the smell or the sound, like some sound, some song reminds you of like a, a treat you used to eat while you were young, or the smell of some, something reminds you of your childhood days where you used to eat these foods. And if people believe that they're giving up these foods rather than I'm empowering myself and eating more meats and I choose to eat that way, then that trigger, that cue can then become a, well, I feel sad for myself. Maybe I should eat that because that reminds me of mom. So I think it's, many things. Um, and I really think it depends on the person, but I think it's really, really smart to focus on the microbiome and, and so that you're not as, you know, you don't have as many of the bad microbes. So I fully agree with you there. I think it's just, it's very bio-individual and that's why it gets so- oh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I agree. You know, there are a lot of people that have uh, intolerance to histamines, which are, yeah. are present oftentimes in yes. fermented foods. So um, it's, it's not ubiquitous. Everybody is going to have a different uh, microbiome and a different situation to look at. And another, you know, yes. interesting point that you made about, you know, earlier memories and stuff. I like to, this is something else I thought of. And I like to tell my clients, if anybody's listening today and you're pregnant and you're going to have a baby or you have a very young baby and you're thinking about your, hopefully you're breastfeeding, um, but you're thinking about starting solid foods. When that baby becomes one years old, most people put this, you know, cupcake in front of or slice of cake with colorful icing and candles clap and sing and, you know, create this, you know, very positive experience. Don't do that. Don't do that to that baby. When your baby's one years old, take a piece of meat. Mm -hmm. If you're a vegan and you're a vegetarian, a chunk of broccoli or, you know, something and put it in front of that child and make, you know, make a big deal. If that's, that's what you want that kid to just eat broccoli, you know, eat healthy, but don't, for God's sakes, get them introduced where you're building a pathway and reaffirming it with singing and happy oh, right, birthday right. And candles. And stuff. Yeah. And it, it creates this, this very early track that sweet is good. Color is good. Uh, yeah. Cake is good. Instead, you know, put down a nice chunk of healthy meat or healthy foods uh, to reaffirm that. And the other thing I, I, I tell mm -hmm. people, try to get away from the the drive of the taste and the sweet test mm -hmm. is when that child is what that child is going to be watching that baby. So when you're, when you're cooking and you're eating, don't put that food in your mouth, go mm, pick up that food and smell it, smell that meat and go, mm, and then put it in your mouth and then don't do mm, good tasting. Just put it in your mouth mm -hmm. so that a kid isn't being trained. The taste guide uh, your food because, you know, it, it's just too often that the kids start paying attention to the, to the taste, sweetness and sugary drinks and candies and things like that. And so I think it can be avoided a lot by parents that are just simply educated. And I think that's how we raised our kids in the past. Slowly but surely, we went off on the deep end, Judy, on a lot of stuff. And that's why I think we're in the, the state that we're in today. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. So you asked about sarcopenia, which, you know, 
is another area of passion that I have that, you know, it's another scourge that um, is related to visceral fat. So when you get visceral fat, it causes this um, atrophy of your muscle. So, so this is an 84 year old gentleman who ate a um, high carbohydrate diet for many years and did a lot of uh, distance durational exercise um, running and, and, uh, a lot, just, uh, you know, no high intensity exercise. You know, if you think about a marathoner, you know, this kind of what the marathoners are heading to, you know, they just get this very emaciated atrophied look. So he's lost all his pectoralis major muscles. He has none of them. And, um, uh, he has keratosis, uh, solar retinic keratosis, these black depositions from a high carbohydrate diet mm -hmm. from, from sun exposure. So just a lot of poor uh, tolerance to, uh, to sun if you eat a lot of those carbohydrates. And that's why if you Google keto comma sunburn, you see a lot of people that go keto, just don't get as much, don't have as much problem with sun and don't get as much damage. So this is an example of uh, sarcopenia. And what's interesting and sad about sarcopenia is it, it steals some of their muscles, but just these are his leg muscles. So, um, What's interesting is these, it looks like he's got huge bones, but he really doesn't. He's just, his bones are the same size as yours and mine. It's just, he has little teeny tiny uh, leg muscles. The muscles are really small. And then uh, the other interesting thing that I picked up on the scan was how enormous his bone marrow looks relative right. to like other people's uh, scans. So let me pull up the runner here. See oh, wow. his bone marrow, the bone looks like it's really small. It's it's because his muscles are so big, but his ratio, this is the bony cortex and this is the bone marrow. So this is a healthy ratio. Um, he's got very thick bone cortex. Now what's happening in the sarcopenic patient in this case, do you see how much bigger the ratio is? I mean, it just looks like he's giant bone marrow inside. So what it is, is as uh, this is osteoporosis. So as the bone gets resorbed and you start losing your bone, uh, becomes thin, the, it, it thins from the inside out. So the middle of the bone gets thin and it's replaced with bone marrow until it's so thin and brittle that you get a, a femur fracture. And then 90% uh, mortality from a femur fracture after the age of, I think, 85 within one year. So it's a devastating injury. And so you really, uh, we see a lot of sarcopenia with osteopenia and osteoporosis. Um, and so you really want to preserve that. And the other interesting picture, what happens to um, uh, sarcopenia that I think is worth pointing out, and this is where I have to jump on a hand grenade and, and, and die a little bit, but this is, these are my photographs. And um, they're awful, but this was me when I had the influence of sarcopenia. So I, I believe it, this was only about five years ago. I didn't have much visceral fat in me, but the influence of the visceral fat that I had previously had in me is still noted. So uh, you see older people have a kind of curvature of their spine mm -hmm. that starts to develop and their necks crane forward and they get this, this very you know S-shaped to their spine, cervical spine, thoracic spine, and lumbar spine. And young people have this nice straight up and down look to them. They look a lot better. Well, this is me with getting the S shape. And this is right before I uh, actually gone on a zero carb diet and just was eating. And I, uh, shortly after this, I go zero carb and just eat, eat fat. But the visceral fat, uh, or just eat meat rather, but the visceral fat that was inside of me, of uh, Judy, uh, over my lifetime, most of my adult lifetime, uh, releases all these inflammatory substances that start to impair your musculature. So do you see this belly sticking out? Yeah. Young people just don't believe this. I have young soldiers and they don't believe it. They think I'm sticking my belly out um, or that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, in other cases, I'm sucking it in here. When you get to be 58 and you look like this, good luck sucking it in. You're not going to be able to suck it in. You literally have so damaged your musculature and your abdomen that you can't keep your same amount of your guts in you. And when I would bend over, kind of like walk around and do horsey rides for my kids and, and other kids, I would see this belly hanging down. I'm like, what is that? It looked like udders from a cow. And I tried to suck it in. I couldn't get, <laughs> I couldn't pick that up. But now that I'm carnivore, my, this isn't me sucking in. That's my muscles doing the job. 
I no longer have the atrophy. And you can see the definition of my yes. arms better and my definition of my abdomen is better. And the other interesting thing is, look how much better my veins, my vasculature is. So when you cut out the inflammatory process of visceral fat, you improve blood flow everywhere to your muscles and your muscles just have better tonicity, tone to them, and they perform better. So my definition of health is how you appear and how you perform is, are the best def, is the best definition I have come up with as a health optimizing mm -hmm. physician. So this is a, a good illustration. My whole, you know, my whole spine strained out. It looks like the shape of my head changed, you know, so much the improvement from uh, getting rid of that visceral fat. So hopefully I've spared myself from having sarcopenia older. This was me when I had that fat tummy at one point in my life. I don't have a lot because I didn't like a lot of photographs when I was heavy. And then this is a, a current picture of, of me today. And, you know, by the way, it looks like, you know, a lot of people think, well, maybe I've exercised a lot, but uh, do, between these photographs, my exercise was averaged about uh, five to 10 minutes once every three days. I barely exercise. Wow. And uh, to this day, I hardly exercise very long. It's very high intensity exercise. So if you want to save time, you know, uh, do high intensity exercise. Don't do a lot of durational exercise, but first start by cutting out processed foods and, and eating healthy. And with a healthy body, you'll be able to put on a lot better um, healthy tissue. So yeah. In your image uh, where you're standing side by side, the first image, there's clearly a lot more muscle mass on you in the, the more recent one. One, were you lifting weights to build that body mass or was it mostly diet? I haven't really lifted weights a lot. One of the things I do is maybe some push-ups, some pull-ups, and I like gym rings. So uh, okay. gymnastic rings are some things that, that I like to do. And I believe it or not, I like to climb trees. <laughs> so I do, I do more kind of functional kind of exercise okay. uh, to, to do that. But no, to answer your question, oh. I've never been a big weight lifter. Um, okay. I do lift weights, uh, but I like, I like resistance training and I like variety. I think the best way to, you know, um, really exercise, get yourself uh, healthy is to uh, live a diverse, you know, healthy life. So you know, nature is the best, best at, at optimizing uh, ourselves and, and uh, giving us the kind of changes that we need to, um, to really accomplish that. So another uh, example of, uh, of some of the, the changes that, that happen is this photograph here. Um, I take a lot of pictures. Um, I have clients take pictures of their faces because this is an interesting phenomenon that people should be aware of. It's a modality that, you know, besides tracking visceral fat on an MRI scan or a CT, um, what I noticed after doing 5,000 MRIs is I pay attention to these people's faces and they come back and their faces were changed. Right. And I was like, oh my God, their faces are changing. So there is something about the face when you get rid of visceral fat that you lose inflammation. So this is a picture of my face when I had a high amount of visceral fat. I was 48 here. I only weighed 165. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people incorrectly think that I was fat and, and was overweight and I simply lost weight. But do you see how much more leaner my face has gotten? And really that's a diminished amount of inflammation. So this is an inflamed face from the presence of large amount of visceral fat influencing my physiology, my body, my largest organ, my skin. And then this is a, a much more current uh, picture of myself uh, free of that visceral fat. And I actually weigh more because put on, as you correct, correctly point out, more musculature. So I got rid of fat and replaced it with muscle. So I tell, I get my clients to take facial photographs. Um, I take facial photographs of them. And um, I, I would tell you and your audience to consider taking facial photographs so you can track it. And, and if anybody from Google or Amazon is listening, what I want to do is use a, an artificial intelligence machine learning model to study the facial changes in humans. If a dumb human like myself can pick up these changes, we can teach a machine, a computer to pick up these changes and large quantities of people and map it to data um, on diet and lifestyle and, you know, go through structured data on, on websites, Facebook, and where people put their diets out there. And we can start educating the machine on this. And one day you're going to open up your cell phone and it's going to do biometrics and tell you, yes, you can open this because you're who you are. But it's also going to say today, Judy, you need to sprint this long. You need to eat this. You need to fast this amount of hours. You need to get a cold shower. You need to get this amount of time in a sauna. 
it's going to tell you exactly what you need to do by you know machine learning to figure this out. So that's my theory. And if anybody's listening is involved in that, get a hold of me. That's fascinating because I can see how that would work in terms of dialing in what you need for the day in terms of, I mean, they do that even with your aura ring, right? So they say there's a readiness scale of, oh, you didn't sleep too much, take it easy, that type of thing. But I can't imagine these big companies wanting this to come to light because then, like you said earlier on in our conversation, well, there won't be any more money for insurance and pharma and all of those things, because if we can manually make changes to our lifestyle and our diet, then why do we need these medications? Yeah. Well, I think Amazon, Jeff Bezos, if he was listening to somebody, um, if somebody wanted, you want to be bigger than Amazon, Amazon, Jeff is, is wasting his time. He's fooling around. With, with retail marketing selling products. The biggest part of our economy is healthcare. Right. He or somebody else could come along a, a supply in Amazon by reversing chronic disease and eliminating that, but profiting from that. And you'll, you'll disrupt healthcare. It's the biggest part of our economy. And it's an enormous pot of money uh, that's available for people that understand chronic disease is entirely uh, reversible and preventable. And we know how to do it and we just develop structures through smartphones and lifestyles that tell people you know how to eat what they should be doing how to exercise the lifestyle they should be living and then people start doing it the biggest challenge we have today judy is that you know we just can't get the information to enough people right that they can truly get healthy because they rely on conventional health care that tells them something very different and then we struggle with with uh, confidence problems a lot of people who listen to us you know may dismiss it because they well my doctor is not saying this you know yeah. and so i like to tell people you know, listening, getting nutritional advice and lifestyle advice from a doctor that looks really bad. You know, I, I remember taking my kid to an orthopedic surgeon, this, listening to the guy make noises, trying to get out of, a, out of his chair. I'm like, God, he can't even get out of a chair. Right, and right. I'm supposed to be listening to him about health advice from my, my son. So yeah, we, you know, pay attention to, you know, people that look good and perform well, get health advice, lifestyle advice uh, from them. If I need surgery, yeah. Uh, you know, because I get in a car wreck or something, you know, I'd still rather have a healthier surgeon because he's more like he or she is more likely to make better choices. But, uh, you know, when it comes to um, guiding me how to live uh, my life, I want to I want to get advice from somebody that's proven to me by their appearance and how they perform right. uh, that they've lived their, their life well. And that's really and that's why faces are really interesting because ancestrally for 4 million years, we would have encountered other homo sapiens along the path. And we would have wanted to decide if we wanted to invite them to join our clan right. or in the alternative, let's say, you know, our clan goes crazy and finds out honey and they just sit around and eat honey and they get really heavy. And then, uh, you know, they got these big inflamed faces. And then we, we, you and I are out walking one day and we see, we encounter some other humans with nice, lean, low inflammatory faces. We're going to join that clan. We're going to, you know, leave our clan and join, you know, uh, a healthier clan. So, you know, your face and your body, but, but chiefly your face displays your health. And so it really, appearance is very important and you can learn a lot from the appearance of your face. And if you're, you know, if you're 50 years old, 40, 50 years old, and I say this to women because, it, you know, they, they take out their old photographs and they look at their pretty faces in high school. You can get that back. You're not going to look like you're 18 again, but you can return to that pretty face. The reason why your face has become inflamed and you, you really are troubled about the appearance that you've undertaken is that visceral fat that's so inflammatory, releasing all these cytokines and inflammatory substances going through your bloodstream is causing these changes in your face and your body. So I, I'm really happy to get people free of visceral fat because it just improves their face so much in their body and their quality of life becomes so much dramatically better. It's true. My mother, she went carnivore at like 65, I think maybe 64. And she is reversing in age now. She looks younger and younger. And when she dyes her hair, people think she's in her fifties and now she's 70. And oh, that's great. Yes. And it's incredible because she looks really young and through COVID while all her friends, you know, were stressed out and eating a lot of carbohydrates and processed foods at home, she just maintained her weight. And so now people are, you know, she's piquing people's interest 
and they're like, what's your secret? How are you going this way? And she's literally like, it's, it's meat. I literally only eat meat. And so it's pretty powerful. Yeah. Well, that's great. I, I noticed one, uh, just the other day, I was looking at Sean Baker. He was, he was on, I think he was with Tom Bilyeu. Um, Billy is yes. pretty big guy on uh, Instagram and you know, Sean's face has got dramatically healthier. I don't know that he tracks it. I have to, I have to say one of the reasons why I track faces so much and I track data like crazy is I have a form of Asperger's, all right? I got Asperger's. Everybody's got Asperger's. I'm a little bit further in, in, on, on the spectrum than other people. So I track data and I can see little teeny tiny changes other people can't. So literally I can see a change in, in just a few days in people. It's, it's pretty interesting. But I noticed in Sean's face, he's really diminished his facial creases. I mean, he, he, his face has gotten a lot less inflamed. And I think it's because he's eliminated all those processed foods and eating, uh, eating carbohydrates. So it's a big, uh, a big positive change in Sean's appearance. His skin looks great. He's obviously putting on a lot of muscle mass at his age. I think Sean's 53. So yeah, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the carnivore diet. I think we're going to learn um, a lot about, you know, the carnivore diet. We're going to see these kind of changes. And the, you know, I have a client that I've got carnivore and he's older and his voice is changing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's very interesting that, you know, the, the fatty infantrists I went through with your, your, with you earlier about those fatty infantrists and muscles, those invade the, the voice, you know, the oh, laryngeal tissues in the tongue. So you, you probably have all had experience where they talk to somebody that gets heavy and as they get heavy over a period of time, they get more and more heavy. And pretty soon, mm -hmm. you know, my name is Chubby. You know, my, my daddy was Chubby and I'm Chubby too. You know, they just get this thickened tongue from the deposition of fat that we can see on an MRI in oh, the tongue. So fascinating. It begins to change that. And then this inflammation also diminishes your quality of your voice, how you enunciate your, your ability to articulate and you, and you lose your, your ability to speak. So you get this older sounding voice. It's hard. And everything about your physiology as you become healthy sounds the alarm that don't pay attention to me. I don't know how to live. I've lived poorly. And so the other really important point I like to make to audiences is I want to try to get to the elderly and get them to be healthy because they have such generational knowledge that they could impart. When I was younger, we revered the elderly. But the, right. the, when I was a young man, the elderly was, were way healthier than they are today. So biologically, the younger people today, it's not their fault. They don't pay attention to the elderly because it's biology. The, the elderly are so filled with disease, their brains at a very primitive level are wired to say this older person is not relevant and doesn't have that much to offer me because they look so bad and diseased. Why am I going to listen to them? So if you're an older person and you got grandkids or you're about to have grandkids, kids, you want to stay relevant in their lives. You, you want to do that. You want to be healthy. So get yourself healthy. Uh, make these lifestyle choices. You'll have a younger sounding voice for a much longer period of time. You'll have a more, a more favorable appearance so that you can speak into their lives and be a better influencer to them. And, uh, and it's, it's just fascinating to me that, that health and a lack of health is consistent. Your skin, your face, your body, your performance, your senses, your sounds, how you speak, how you listen, how you balance, how you walk. You know, I can tell people that are older just how they walk and and and, and young people, just their ability to ambulate is, you know, uh, getting up and out of a chair. It's, it, it's a consistent story of degradation of health or preservation of health. So we see really high performers that are older have made good lifestyle choices look that way and perform better in into their uh, much older years because of those choices that they made. Yes, that makes so much sense. I have uncles that kind of have that S curve shapes and they're diabetic and they think it's crazy that we're eating mostly meat. So it's, it's fascinating. Whereas my mom stopped taking all of her diabetic medications. You know, thank you so much for this conversation. Uh, where can people find you? Um, if people wanted to get the MRI scan specifically from you, you know, where, where can people find you? Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And so um, you can find out more information about me on uh, Instagram you know, at uh, D-R-S-E-A-N-O-M-A-R-A, -A, Dr. Sean O'Mara. 
on Instagram and Twitter. And I'm also on YouTube at mm -hmm. Dr. E-R period, S-E-A-N space O apostrophe M-A-R-A. -A. YouTube somehow put that apostrophe. I never use it, but somehow YouTube assigned me an apostrophe. Oh. I don't like it because lo I lose, you know, my reservations at, uh, at uh, airports and, and hotels and stuff. But they, they can reach me at that. And I also have a website, MedCon Wellness, M-E-D-C-O-N-W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S.com. I try to accommodate as many people as possible to get MRI scans on. I can usually get MRI scans for people that are willing to, to come to Minneapolis and, and get mm -hmm. those scans done. And then uh, a handful of people I work with and stay in relationship with to try to optimize them if they're really motivated. So if you're a type A and you really want to optimize yourself, I'd uh, be really interested in hearing from you. Well, thank you so much. I'll put all the information in the show notes. Thank you for all these visuals. I think people will not forget how visceral fat looks in the body. And I think for some people that don't have enough of the motivation or have loved ones that aren't willing to change really, because they, you know, they may be skinny fat and maybe just time that they can have this uh, test done where they can start looking at their visceral fat. Well, great. I hope so. I think it's, yeah, it's a super important area to, to think about. And I hope we can change how physicians are trained in medical school and nutritionists. I think, I think visceral fat, I mean, it's, it's out there. You can Google and you see all these bad things about it, but nobody knows, nobody's doing anything how to get rid of it. Right. Uh, that, that's, I specialize in getting rid of visceral fat and uh, I want to educate as many people as possible. So I, I just welcome the opportunity to come on your show, Judy. I love your content. Thank um, you. you're, you're super good. I, I love your passion and your, your drive and you're, you're making a huge difference. Your following is, is awesome. Thank so you. I hope you can continue to build on that. And uh, yeah, maybe we can uh, have another chance to talk at some point too. Yes. Sounds good. Thank you so much again. Okay. All right. Thanks, Judy. Okay, guys. I hope that you enjoyed this interview. If you take anything away from this, it's that diet and nutrition has such a powerful impact in your wellness. A lot of people can be skinny fat where they look really thin or relatively healthy outside, but internally they may already be showing signs of disease. One way that you can quickly check that is doing these MRIs and just seeing your level of visceral fat. As you can tell from the conversation with Dr. O'Mara, it's actually really important to keep tabs on it as it is a big reason for a lot of our metabolic disease. Please make sure to like and subscribe on podcast, please make sure to leave a review. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you guys next week. Bye guys.